Good evening. My name is Leslie Hunt, and I'm the Director of Graduate Programs at the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences here at Baruch College. And I am here to offer you a welcome on behalf of the Dean of the Weissman School, Aldemira Romero. We are very pleased to have you here at Baruch, the home of the Master's Program in Corporate Communications. There are many things that distinguish Baruch's master's program in corporate communication. The program has recently been ranked by PR Week as one of the top five outstanding education programs in the country. And this program benefits from a deep and rich connection to the industry. The industry connections happen through the graduate program's faculty and their relationships with organizations such as the internationally known Corporate Communications International Research Center that's housed here at Baruch. They have relationships with the Arthur Page Society and with the PR Museum. We are really very proud to have the industry leader, Shelley Spector, who is the president of Spector & Associates and the founder of the Museum of Public Relations, which is currently housed here at Baruch. Shelley's course is titled, From Plato to Twitter, a History of Influence, Media, and Public Opinion. It's an extraordinarily popular course here at Baruch, and it analyzes the history of public relations and its application to contemporary global practice. The Museum of PR is the world's only organization that is dedicated to preserving, exhibiting, and teaching the history of PR. It was founded in 1997, and it's been here at Baruch for the last four years, where it's produced more than a dozen events that have been streamed around the world and have attracted students, educators, professionals, and industry leaders. The topics are appealing, um, and it helps us look at the lens of history to provide context to current events. As you've seen in the slideshow this evening, I hope you noticed it, the Museum of PR hosts annually black PR history, Latino PR history, and women who changed history, as well as events like this evening's program, which is focused on values-based decision-making. And mark your calendars for May, where there will be a RAND report called Truth Decay, the implications of public relations in a toxic information environment, again, hosted and produced by the amazing Shelley Spector, the founder of the Museum of Public Relations. But this evening's topic, this critical topic of values, here at Baruch is discussed across the entire institution, in the Zicklin School of Business, and the Marx School of Public Affairs, and here in the Weissman School of Arts and Sciences. And tonight's event is a special panel discussion with top industry thought leaders who will share insights and perspectives on what we need to do to be prepared to manage and lead trusted organizations now and in the future. This evening's panel is moderated by Craig Rothenberg. Where, where have you landed? There you go, Craig. Now, Craig is an unusually accomplished communications executive with more than three decades of experience. For more than 20 years, Craig worked at Johnson & Johnson, the global healthcare leader and very trusted and respected company. Among his many roles at J&J, &J, Craig led global pharmaceutical communication and global employee and executive communication. He provided strategic counsel and communication support to Alex Gorski, the CEO and chairman, and to a number of other senior company executives, ensuring that the strategic priorities of the executive committee were translated across the 130,000 person organization. <clears throat> He is the founder and chief executive officer of Rothenberg Communications, which is a strategic consultancy that provides communication support, leadership, and counsel to organizations large and small. He is also an adjunct professor in public relations and corporate communications at NYU, where he teaches in the graduate program. And I hope that you'll help me also welcome Craig Rothenberg. Thank you, Lizzie. Thanks. Thank you all. And thank you for that too long introduction, Leslie. Um, I'm really glad um, to see so many faces out here. And I'm especially glad to see faces of people who have been in the field for a few years uh, and those who are starting out. And I'm especially glad to see a bunch of my former students from NYU sitting in the audience tonight. I think that this discussion that we're about to uh, have this evening could not be more timely 
Fact is, I could be here next week, probably next month, probably next year, and make that statement. It would be equally true, uh, given what we're all facing uh, with. The one thing, uh, the one assurance I'll give you right up front is, we promised you a robust, rich discussion with some luminaries and true thought leaders. You're going to get that. The other promise we gave to you is that there'll be a networking reception to follow. We're going to honor our commitment to that. We're going to make sure that you have time to network uh, afterwards. So thanks, uh, thanks for being here. Um, before we get going with the program, a few obligatory thank yous. None of this would ha be happening tonight if not for the, um, the graciousness and, um, uh, and charitable giving, if you will, of our sponsors. So let me, uh, let me just recognize them. Weber Shan and if you're here representing any of these sponsors, would you just please stand as I call your company's names out? Weber Shanwick. <laughs> APCO Worldwide. Uh, the Page Society, I know we're waiting for Roger to arrive, he'll be here I'm sure. Uh, the Arthur Page Center, um, Johnson & Johnson is well represented as uh, you've already heard and you'll continue to hear. Hunter Public Relations, anyone here from Hunter? Great, glad you're here. Uh, Bill Nielsen, Bill is on our panel tonight. Bill has not only given graciously of uh, you know, countries, but Bill has given countless hours of his time in the framing of tonight's discussion. Um, and so thank you to all of our sponsors. If you're here representing any of these schools as I call you out, would you please stand? We've got a number of students here in the room with us tonight representing NYU. Glad you're here. Columbia. Okay. Uh, Syracuse, the Newhouse School. There, there you go. Uh, Baruch, obviously, who's uh, graciously hosting us. Thank you and thank you, Leslie. The College of Staten Island. Uh, the City College of New York, CCNY, and the University of Washington. Great. Glad you guys are here. Um, I should also point out that in addition to a fairly full room, this, uh, this discussion is being uh, uh, streamed via Facebook Live through the museum's Facebook page. So we have, uh, I'd like to be able to say like Las Vegas, what, what happens here stays here. The fact is, what happens here is being transmitted out. So uh, if you need to mind your P's and Q's, be, uh, be aware of that. But we do hope that we'll have a rich, robust discussion. Um, thanks again, uh, as Leslie said, to Shelley and Barry and anyone connected with the museum. For those of you who are not familiar with the, the Museum of Public Relations, I really, really encourage you to take some time to, uh, to tour the artifacts, because like Leslie said, I think, you know, as we think about the field, the profession of public relations, there is so much to be learned from the past that we can apply to present day and the future practice of public relations, and I really implore you. And if for no other reason, if you, don't, if you want to dismiss all that, it's a really fun hour or two just going through the artifacts. Um, so anyway, um, there's, uh, there's that. On their website, which is prmuseum.org, prmuseum.org, uh, you'll see upcoming programs, some of which Leslie has already highlighted. They're reflected on this slide here. Um, take the time to see what programs are upcoming, because like this, like this one, hopefully, I think you'll find other programs that will be of interest uh, to you. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. In the packet that you got, right, or the little booklet that you got when you registered, you have it. So I'm not going to go into their credentials, because uh, that would take us till 8 o'clock if I did that with, uh, with each. But let me call them up one by one. Uh, Roger, oh, sorry. Roger Bolton, who's the president of the Arthur Page Society, I'm confident will join us in progress. When he does, I will direct him to his seat right here to my left. You are right. Uh, Roger Fine, uh, retired general counsel of Johnson & Johnson. I'll say a few more words in a moment about that. Roger, come on up. Joyce Hernigan, uh, retired chief communication officer at not just GE, but also uh, Con Ed. So Joyce. Jack Leslie, the chairman of Weber Shanwick. And Jack, thanks for your sponsorship. Glad you're here. Bill Nielsen, uh, a real icon in our field, well, as are everyone taking their seats up here. Uh, Bill is a retired, uh, general, uh, chief, retired chief, chief communications officer at Johnson & Johnson. Michael Sneed, who has that role and uh, the role of worldwide vice president of corporate affairs at, uh, at Johnson & Johnson currently, someone I work closely with throughout my career. Erica Sutherland from uh, Howard University, so that we have an academics perspective. And then there is me. So we'll wait till they get up here. The idea tonight, excuse me, the idea tonight is to really make this a conversation. So I said to our, our panelists that the heaviest lift I think that they really have to, had to consider was just the act of getting here and giving their time, you know, in thinking about this and being here because we really want to keep this conversational. We've anchored tonight's discussion around a premise statement that I will read to you and then I'll leave it on the screen 
And this is the frame for tonight's discussion. So think about this uh, as, as we have the panelists' opening remarks and the questions you might have vis-a-vis -vis this premise statement. National political and civil discourse has deteriorated significantly over the past two decades, accelerating the last two years, and with it, so too has trust in organizations. The very foundation of trust has been and remains challenged. This has impacted not only the role of senior communication and corporate affairs professionals, but it has also had an impact on society's views and expectations of leaders and executive management teams inside organizations of all sizes. The climate for decision making has been consequently stressed and altered, expressing values, earning and maintaining trust, and demonstrating a clear sense of purpose may be more critical today than ever before. Those who've been in the field, hopefully you have that perspective. Those of you who are embarking on your careers or will soon uh, upon uh, graduation from whether it's NYU or Baruch or any of the other esteemed academic institutions, you'll, uh, this is the environment that you'll be moving into. So I'm going to leave this premise statement in its entirety up here. And before I turn to our panelists who have the much harder job than I do, I get to ask the questions. They have to answer them. Um, I mentioned Roger Fine. So Roger, like I said, is the former general counsel at uh, Johnson & Johnson. A number of years ago, a program that I and a team I was a part of at Johnson & Johnson developed, a professional development program that we developed at Johnson & Johnson, a seminal moment for me and many others who were there at the time participating in this program, uh, we had the good fortune of bringing Bill Nielsen and Roger Fine in from retirement for effectively what was a fireside chat. And the reason I really felt strongly about wanting Roger on this panel tonight takes me back to that discussion, which must have been eight or nine years ago at this point. In my now 38 or 39 year career, I have never seen a, uh, a, uh, a strategic alliance, the likes of which I saw between a general counsel, Roger, and a chief communication officer, Bill Nielsen, uh, the way I saw it at play in those days at Johnson & Johnson. And like many, or in fact, like any large organizations, J&J &J has had its stresses and challenges through the years. And never was there a moment that I didn't feel, at least looking on from the sidelines, that in our general counsel and in our chief communications officer, there wasn't an aligned spirit there, aligned around making sure that the reputation of Johnson & Johnson was safeguarded, not simply based on the words that were coming from the general counsel to the CEO and chairman, but from the general counsel and the chief communication officer. So I thought, we thought, um, that having Roger, you here with us today would be really, really critical to today's discussion, so we're glad you're with us. Uh, one other comment before I turn to the panelists is Erica Sutherland is from Howard University. We also felt it was really critical to have on our panel an academic, someone who is dedicating her career, in this case, to training uh, the next generation of leaders in our field. And so I'm going to direct a couple times, Erica, directly to you, some questions. So how does this apply to the classroom environment and what you're imparting on, on your students, okay? Uh, so I'm going to turn to the panelists and ask for any reflections, reactions, comments they have in response to this premise statement. And then the floor is going to be open to you um, to ask any questions you have vis-a-vis -vis this premise statement. Does that make sense? And can I count on you to ask questions? Okay, any students who are counting on me from the NYU to help you with graduation, I'm counting on seeing some hands go up, okay? <laughs> so, panelists, um, Bill, I'm gonna turn to you first, if you don't mind, Bill Nielsen. Um, you know, as you think about this premise statement, thoughts, reflections, what, is this, what does this say to you? And what's it, what's it mean to, what should it mean to everyone here? So, I'm opening, is that what you're asking me? That's to it. Okay, all right. Uh, well, I'd like to add thanks on behalf of all of us to all of you for being here tonight. What um, you're about to witness, uh, we hope, is just going to be um, a, um, a stream of consciousness uh, from those of us who are reflecting on the times. And I really think, um, given the premise statement, uh, it, this is, um, it's hard to argue that we aren't at a very uh, important moment uh, in history with um, so many changes occurring in society, uh, both positive and negative, un unfortunately, and so much challenge to existing institutions and a decline in trust in almost every one of those institutions. We see the impact on uh, corporations and other large organizations 
uh, daily as they try to answer challenges put to them in social media. And um, I think it's, it's useful to talk about this new dynamic mm -hmm. in terms of what kind of culture ought to be represented in these organizations and um, what are the real challenges to trying to adhere to the truth and to um, truly be responsive. Um, I think uh, for all of you in this room who are in communications or are headed that way, uh, I couldn't frankly be happier uh, for you. Um, I think this career field um, is one in which, uh, as I experienced and we've all experienced, there is an opportunity to make a real difference in, in uh, what's happening in society and within our organizations. All of that under great challenge and stress uh, today. And um, I think that a big part of the answer to that ultimately is going to come back to the cultures in the organizations that we represent. Um, and I think that's about you know, understanding what's important, who we are, what's important about what we do, and what are the responsibilities that we're prepared to accept for the various constituents? And to understand that within an organization uh, gives us a much firmer foundation on which to respond to all of the external stimuli that's going on. The role of the chief communications officer, as you know, is very horizontal in any organization. But I would also say that the role of general counsel or the law department also has a responsibility to be horizontal and to look in a wider context. I had the very good fortune of working with Roger Fine for quite a number of years. Uh, we stopped counting, didn't we, Roger? Yeah. Um, we went through some uh, really tough issues together, but also had a chance to see um, what it was like and how we could influence change within an organization. Roger, you've been away from it for a while now. We're still um, working together on the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. But why don't you give some reflection about culture, corporate culture, from the top lawyer's perspective? Well, <clears throat> whoops. Susan, can you hear me? Um, well, it's a big subject. Um, uh, I. I uh, it's going to sound like a mutual admiration society, but Bill, Bill brought uh, a new idea uh, to, um, uh, to Johnson & Johnson. And uh, the idea was that um, the public relations group and the law department had a common, should have a common objective and could actually uh, work together. And um, I was surprised when Bill pointed out to me that this was not always, always the case. In fact, maybe the exception um, that um, uh, public relations and the law department were uh, often at at, uh, at odds. Um, I guess I had an unusual idea also, which is that um, the job of uh, everybody in the organization was to be honest uh, with our audiences, uh, with our public uh, audiences. Uh, I used to have um, conversations that went like, um, People would say, "Well, we we can't do that because that'll we can't say that because that'll get us into legal trouble, or it would be an admission against our interest if when there's litigation over this." And uh, my reaction always was, "Hey, are you trying to do my job? Uh, <laughs> um, let's just get the truth out uh, and be honest. And uh, whatever the legal consequences are, that's why we have a law department. You know, that's why I'm here. That's why the lawyers are here." and uh, we'll uh, handle the uh, legal fallout as, uh, as best we could. So I think that was, um, it was a case of um, Bill and, uh, and me uh, meeting each other halfway and uh, realized that we had this, uh, the, the, uh, the same objective. Um, I, I think um, in terms of culture, Bill, um, and this has really um, worsened a lot since I retired. I retired from the company 14 years ago. Um, the, the internal um, communication has really, um, as far as I can tell, has really um, uh, deteriorated. And I blame it on um, uh, the new tech uh, technology. I'm probably going to talk too long here, but I would like to 
give you an example of what I'm talking about. I think it, it, it impacts directly on ethical decision making and high value uh, decision making. Bill came to me, um, Craig, you, you, you know, I always tell um, um, people who are in your position that you need to bring a gong when I talk, all right? Because you know lawyers, You're get, not close to it. lawyers get paid by the word here, <laughs> so um, I want to be able to turn this over. But I have a little story that I'll take a minute or two, which is Bill came to me one day with what I thought was a crazy idea. He said, you know, we ought to teach our people um, how to make ethical decisions, the process for ethical decision making. I said, Bill, that's, what, how, how can we come up with a process for ethical decision making? So the longer we, longer we talked about it, we realized that there was a way to do this. I, I give Bill the credit for this. Um, he was kind of the intellectual um, uh, godfather of this idea. Long story short, I think we proved something to ourselves and our people that was, was really important, a really important lesson. Um, we created a series of, of about a handful of um, vignettes of scenar scenarios that were thinly disguised versions of real screw-ups at uh, untoward events at uh, Johnson & Johnson that had led to crises at the company. And um, we provided um, multiple choice uh, questions, about five of them. Um, one of them, one of the answers uh, was insane. Uh, in terms of solutions, how would you resolve this, this, uh, th this crisis? One of them was insane. One of them wasn't insane. It was just dumb. Uh, and three, were, you know, reasonable people could differ. One of them was, you know, a really good answer. So uh, we had, um, we brought in about uh, 30 middle managers at a time. And we, uh, for a, a full day course on uh, ethical decision making, the Johnson & Johnson credo. And we gave them some pre-work and we sent out the scenarios and they also, on their, all on their own, came up with the answers. We collected the answers and we showed them to the group as soon as they came in. And um, the, um, the answers were a very short and very wide bell-shaped curve, including people who had chosen the answers that were insane and what I call, what I call insane and dumb. And uh, after we, we showed them that, and then we told them to all do this same exercise now as a group at their tables, eight people at a time. And after about a half hour discussion, they handed in the answers. Everybody went to lunch. We um, tallied the, the data. And we showed them the um, answers, the solutions to these uh, crises, these ethical issues, after the group discussion. And all of a sudden, the bell-shaped curve was very narrow and very high. And the insane and dumb answers were gone. And there was some serious um, reflection on, um, on how to handle um, these crises. And uh, it was a very vivid, stark example that we taught our people, which was the people who fl flew solo in an organization usually messed up, frequently messed up, and got themselves in the organization in trouble. And when there was teamwork and good internal communication, we came up with sensible answers. And finally, I'll make one other point because it goes directly to, um, to, to, to this whole project that we did together, which is that people mistake ethical decision making for figuring out what's right and what's wrong. Well, that's not what the problem is because usually what's right and wrong, it's obvious. I mean, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder. I mean, those are, I mean, there's, there, there, there's some of that in many, in many, many organizations, but the real issue is that most ethical crises are ethical dilemmas, moral dilemmas, for which, by definition, there is no purely ethical solution. If there were, it wouldn't be a dilemma. So that's what requires um, communication and, uh, and teamwork. And that's what Bill and I and our organizations were able to, uh, to, to do together. I, I, wanna, I wanna circle back to that in a yeah. moment. And when it comes to high tech, one, one okay. final sentence. There's so little communication going on today. Everybody's texting and emailing, right? There's, 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 no, there's very little conversation going on. There's no kind of uh, that kind of uh, collaboration. I, I really think digital technology today is a major challenge to value decision-making in large organizations. Sorry I talked so No, long. no, that said, 
I'm going to do something that you might not be happy with, because what I didn't flag from the start is use technology tonight, okay? <laughs> you, see, you see some hashtags up here, feel, so feel, feel free. Oops. Okay. Uh, I need to go back to the slideshow. There we go. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Let me go back. Sorry, guys. There we go. I'd like to hear from some other panelists. Any reactions to the premise statement? Thoughts that you might have? Jack? Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, while we're talking about culture and what's going on in companies, and it's, by the way, well, thank you, by the way, to the Museum of Public Relations for hosting this and all of you for coming. It's great um, to sit and sur be surrounded by all of uh, my friends from Johnson & Johnson because if there's a if there's a place where, as Bill puts it, you know where you stand and you know what your responsibilities are, it's, it's there. I mean, if any of you, by the way, haven't had an opportunity to go down to New Brunswick and walk in the front lobby, I presume it's still there. It's been a few years since I've been there. Yeah. There, etched in stone, on your left as you walk in the door is the credo. Uh, and I think pretty much, I hope still everyone, Michael at Johnson & Johnson, has that pretty well memorized. So there are a few institutions, I think, that have that really ingrain that. And that's where it starts, at the core. And that's where I thought maybe I'd just make uh, a, couple of, a couple of quick comments. Um, the, at, at Weber Shanwick, we've been, for the last, I guess, six years or so, uh, researching civility. Um, we've started in the United States. We're starting to, to, to move that outside of, of, of the U.S. But as one can imagine here, certainly, over the last six years, the level of incivility has uh, pretty well uh, gone off the charts. Um, three quarters of Americans think that incivility has reached a crisis uh, stage in the United States. Um, and uh, and obviously, the incivility has, has really um, ratcheted up as a result of the political environment that we find ourselves in. And I, I was taken with, and this is where I want to kind of take the comment about the workplace. I remember a quick story of right after the election when a lot of organizations were struggling to try to figure out how they were going to communicate internally, and there was so much anxiety. Um, and mo many organizations, I think, wisely decided that they would at least open up discussion um, and have, it wasn't somebody was right or wrong, but at least be able to have a civil discussion after having such a long, prolonged period of incivility. And so we had an open call. Um, and it struck me, and then we subsequently did a little research on this, a woman from the Midwest said at one point, I just, I just couldn't wait to get to work. And what she was saying is she couldn't wait to get to work because it was a safe harbor. Uh, and then we did some research, and you find that if you ask um, about incivility, it's something like 76% of politicians are uncivil. And you guys in the back room can correct me, but I think that 68% of in social media is uncivil. And it's like 56% of the media is uncivil. And the lowest one uh, on, the, uh, on the list was corporate America. 86% uh, of, of uh, workers find that their workplace is civil and respectful. And I took note of that because I think it's so important that we recognize that uh, as companies, we really have a responsibility to provide uh, an area where we can begin to at least engage in civil discourse. The, the, what, and we'll get, I'm sure we'll peel this onion as we go through this, but obviously what's behind um, this, um, I love, by the way, provocative. I don't know who came up with provocative environment. I was reaching back to my parochial school days and thinking that was Latin for crazy. <laughs> it's a crazy environment that we're in. Um, but, but so much of it is, I think, you know, has its roots um, in, in not just the trust uh, that, uh, that Bill referenced and that there's plenty of research on, um, but in the way we're now um, expressing ourselves, in the way that we're not able to have uh, good civilized uh, dialogue, um, in, the, in, in some of the basic inequalities that exist uh, that's, uh, that's underlying um, this. 
Uh, and this is, a, this is not just something in the United States. This is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just tied to technology, although technology is, can sometimes play a role in it, particularly the, the bubbles that we exist in and the fact that oftentimes we can hide uh, on social media and, and, and be uncivil. But, but I, I, don't, I don't really attribute it as much to technology um, as I do to a number of trends that are happening all over the world uh, that are causing the populism and nationalism that underlies fa under uh, that really undermines faith in democracy, and we see it. You know, we saw it last weekend in Hungary. Um, we see it in Poland, and we see it. In fact, Freedom House. Just if you haven't seen it, Freedom House had a poll out a few weeks ago that's talked about for the last 12 years straight. We've had a retrenchment in liberal democracy. We've seen far more countries going in the wrong way. So, uh, but I, I just wanted to, as you guys were talking about. Uh, companies culture kind of bring it bring it back to say that that, that the core we we have to if we start anyway we anywhere we have to start with our own companies uh, to make sure that we have a, a, a civil and respectful environment before we get the next perspective we've been joined fortunately by Roger Bolton who a week ago I would have said was the president of the Arthur Page Society I think I now have to introduce you as the president of page since you've undergone a, uh, a, a, a name change. So we're glad you're here. I also should have said, uh, for those of you looking up here and seeing seven people on a panel, it's a rather large panel. As we began planning for this, in every planning discussion early on, when we threw out another name, we said, oh yeah, got to have her, got to have him. So this is a table of got to haves. And that's why you see uh, seven panelists. And I think each offers a distinct and important perspective. So Roger, welcome. Uh, we've asked panelists, Roger, to re react or reflect on the premise statement. So that's what's going on now. I saw a hand down here, I think. Bill? Uh, I just wanted to follow up on <clears throat> Jack's comment um, and maybe to stretch out this word provocation um, a little bit. Uh, I think you would accept the fact that because of the socialization of, you know, uh, consumers, um, customers, publics all over the world uh, who are now armed with the internet, um, Big companies uh, suffer a fair amount of provocation uh, in the marketplace. There are new demands uh, on CEOs to take positions on controversial issues. There are new, new demands that are voiced, um, you know, on product quality, just about every aspect of our government. So, and then um, what has been increasing over the last 300, well, whatever, uh, the last year and a half um, has been the provocation of government um, uh, toward uh, toward the business community, and it was we were trying to capture that idea that 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 that, that, that companies no longer uh, operate within their own walls. They are members of society, and the expectations have increased, you know, substantially. So that that's what we were getting at in terms of the the provocation. Uh, just one case, you, you might remember Delta Airlines um, was trying to do the right thing by uh, separating itself from the NRA and um, didn't uh, realize that not only um, was this going to be an offensive uh, move to the Georgia legislature, but probably forgot the fact that a lot of their pilots are um, NRA um, members. and. Um, it has created a great deal of un unrest, but, but that was a case of, of trying to do the, the right thing in a very provocative um, environment. And you all could come up with 10 or 20 others. So, Bill, on, the, on that point, and we can, we just we had our own. Uh, so, a couple of things. I, I think in terms of this environment, I think has is um, short-term thinking versus long-term thinking. And a lot of organizations um, engage in short-term thinking. It, re it results in circling the wagons, obfuscating, keeping the truth to yourself, in the, sen in the in thinking that, you know, we're not going to make the next quarter, we're not going to make the year, um, versus long-term thinking, which is in a totally different uh, dimension because that involves um, putting your reputation first and realizing that uh, everything depends on your reputation. In the end, that's your 
only real asset if you intend to be in business for the long term. And uh, once you're conscious of that as an individual, as a leader, as an organization, you know, it opens up your thinking and your communication to being honest because that's what's in your long-term best interest. Joyce, can I, uh, can I call on you here? I'm, I'm curious without divulging anything that you shouldn't. Take this discussion, take us into Jack Welsh's office and counsel you might have offered him in this spirit. When I was at GE, it sounds like what it was like at J&J &J because I spent a lot of time with lawyers. Um, we were always seemed to be in trouble for everything. Um, people would go up after companies with big pockets, um, just all kinds of things. And Jack, um, is part of his public image was, I think, a little bit of bluster and feistiness and um, maybe slamming the fist on the table. But he was a, continues to be, a, a pretty moral person. And it, I never had to fight with him to convince him that the best policy was always to tell the truth, admit mistakes, and take responsibility for fixing or changing whatever may have happened. Maybe there were a little theatrics and drama in um, having this kind of discussion with Jack, but his, his heart and soul and mind was always in the right place. Is that what you were looking for? Exactly, yeah, yeah. thank you. One of my, my favorite uh, New Yorker cartoon was uh, this uh, CEO with a big cigar that's at the end of the table was board meeting and he's saying, um, I know honesty is the best policy. Now what's the second best policy? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, we have, yeah, right here. Um, actually, Michael, I wanted to ask you a question about the Lori Ingram situation you described in light of someone else brought up Delta and alienating. Um, by, by taking aside, they alienated certain important constituents. What was your, what was the process like for you and your colleagues inside Johnson & Johnson in making the decision to pull your advertising from Lori Ingram? What were the considerations, the criteria? What kinds of uh, responses did you anticipate, positive and negative? And what ultimately led you to the decision that you made? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'll be, uh, this will be a, a good, uh, be a good discussion on uh, sometimes what to do and also what not to do. So let me say that first. Um, one of the things that I think we find in this in an environment today is companies often are oftentimes are forced to make very very quick decisions, and I will tell you from our experience that's always the last thing you want to do. Uh, and I, I think there's been many examples. You can look at uh, what's happened with Starbucks recently. A lot of what I would say first generation companies they feel like they've got to get out there first and be in front of something and make a decision. When oftentimes you don't realize you've got more time than you think to actually be much more uh, intentional. Um, so in this case, believe it or not, I would say this was a case of um, us not actually following that process. So just to be very candid, um, we've got a process where uh, because Johnson & Johnson is so large, we've got a lot of people who are involved in these decisions, and we, and we have a process called the trigger process. So a trigger process is what, what happens when an event has the potential to affect the total corporation from a reputation perspective. Roger just brought that up. So everything is around reputation. Um, the advertising that we were running was actually for one of our pharmaceutical products. So it was fairly you know, deep in the organization, uh, someone uh, took the decision deep in the organization to make that decision and in fact had, had not thought through the implications of what that would have for the corporation. So they in their minds thought they were doing the right thing. Oh my gosh, it's Laura Ingram. She said the horrible thing. We can't be associated with it. So actually when it finally got to me, the way it should have worked is 
they should have come to me and let me know before we made it that we were thinking of this. And in fact, as we, as we dissected that process, we probably would have made an actually, probably would have made a different decision. So, so I'm not here to say we actually, it's a great example of where we don't always make the right decision, but what I can tell you out of that was it's very important when you're, when you're the stewards of the reputation of an organization to really take the opportunity to think through all the implications, understand the impact of all of your stakeholders, because something may feel really good in the moment. And I will tell you, our people felt they were doing the right thing. And in fact, it really got us into quite a pickle, to be quite honest. And for someone like myself, who has the purview of the total enterprise, uh, had we followed the process that we actually had in place, so again, part of it is you can have a process, but if you don't follow it, it doesn't really matter. Um, had we followed the process, we would have ended up at a different place. So that's a little behind the scenes in terms of how that took place in real time, and in I terms of that actual example. You're probably trend, uh, trending on Twitter right now, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael, Michael, can you tell us what that process would have been and where you would have ended? Or is that? You know, I, I think uh, in terms of, well, first of all, it's, it's a process where, uh, again, if you understand the, the structure of Johnson & Johnson, we are, you know, 200 plus companies. Um, we have all, hundreds of brands. Um, we value the notion of decision making, pushing that down. That's all well and good. We want our folks to be close to the customer. But in today's environment, we recognize that so many things ladder up to the corporate parent. And at the end of the day, as much as we love each of our individual brands, the only brand that matters from a reputation and trust perspective is the Johnson & Johnson trust mark. So in that regard, uh, we always have to be careful in terms of what decision we do or don't make. So I I'm not here to say we necessarily would have made a different decision, but I think we would have been more thoughtful and and not in only in making it, but also explaining the rationale behind it. Because it's interesting. We, we in the case of Johnson & Johnson, our CEO, Alex Gorski, he's very prolific when it comes to blogs and things like that. And oftentimes, he stepped in some, into some very controversial issues. But a lot of how we've managed those, and it's really through the, through the work of communicators like yourself, is being able to frame the issue in the right way so that people can actually have a civil conversation, which is what we talked about earlier. So you can, you can make difficult decisions so long as you understand the rationale and so even to the point where people who may not agree, they actually understand your rationale. It's, it's difficult when you don't have the rationale behind it. And that's when people get, get, their, you know, get their dander up a bit because they're just thinking you're reacting, and that importantly, you may not be consistent in your, in your actions vis-a-vis -vis things that you've done in the past. So all of that has to go into the equation, quite honestly, before you make it. And it's why, in these cases, it's almost lethal to try and be first. I'd much rather be second or third or last and know that I've got it right, as opposed to being, I'm out there first and I'm leading the charge, in this case, you actually don't want to be doing that. Jack, I'm sure no one would argue with wanting to get it right, but I'm, I'm interested in, as you counsel clients, what, what kind of weight do you attach to speed? Well, uh, yeah, I was just actually taking some notes on that. Um, well, we attach a lot to speed, but I, uh, um, it, it doesn't pay to be first if you're wrong. Uh, it doesn't uh, pay to be first if you don't have your own act together. So do those things, do those things before you get out there. What I was going to, and I'll, I'll kind of maybe wind my way back to that, but I was just going to, some of the notes I was making, your question about what's the bigger change here is kind of, is a, is a great question, and I'm sitting here thinking about it. And, and I think part of it has to do with the nature of empowerment today. Let me explain that. We, the, the trends, the so-called provocative environment that we have right now, politically at least, is we, we've seen this movie before. You know, we saw it in the Gilded Age, and we saw it in the Roaring Twenties, and one led to 
to a, a world war. Another led to a depression and a world war. They both led to nationalism and fascism and populism. Both, all of them for the same reasons we're faced now, which is, has to do with income inequality. All of them had to do with periods where we were, we were creating great wealth, like we have in this technology revolution, but it was going to a few. And institutions weren't able to fulfill the expectations of the public, and, and they, they felt failed. And that led to distrust, and it's the, we're just seeing the same movie again. What's different, I think, is uh, we're communicating differently. We, in those other periods of time, we were in, in a broadcast era. Institutions sent out a press release or did a broadcast for the evening news, and we hope we did research. I was back then, by the way. I'm not back in the Gilded Age, but <laughs> back when we did in the broadcast era, and we did a lot of research, and we had a fairly good idea how people would respond. But it was, a, it was much more of a one-way communication. Now in this engagement era, where there's immediate response, what's happened is we've empowered, uh, we've empowered individuals to a, to a level they've never had before. Politically, I used to be a political consultant, and I used to tell my, my clients this, you know, there was another technology revolution that changed politics all over the world, and, that was, it was, and it was a disruptive technology, and that was television. Because what television did was it allowed candidates to go right over the heads of established political parties and organizations and go right into the living rooms of voters. And voters could look in that television, on that television screen, and they could tell whether they were telling the truth. They, they, they could, and all of a sudden, character became more important than issues. All of a sudden, political parties started to fall apart. The same thing's happening now. You fast forward 30, 40 years, it's, it's, it's a digital environment that allows individuals so much more power. So now getting around to the point of speed, what we're constantly struggling with is, and particularly in the era of bots and everything else, is what does that, when this is starting to happen, what does it really mean? You know, well, how does it really affect our, our reputation? First, get some assessment of what's going on. And I give you lots of examples where, you know, troublemakers have been out there very effectively creating a lot of smoke when, in fact, there really isn't much fire. Um, and so you need to be careful, too, in misreading. But I, I think to try to answer your question, the, the angst that we feel in this so-called provocative environment so often comes from our lack of control and the speed with which this is happening and the power that few individuals have uh, to affect the communications environment that we didn't, that we didn't used to have. On the, uh, on the speed up in the environment, um, <clears throat> one of the um, difficulties in talking about the 1992 Tylenol poisoning event in Chicago is that it was such a different time. Hmm? 82, I'm sorry, 82. Um, I wasn't with the company at the time, but um, the events occurred in Chicago and uh, became public very quickly, and the company was, was called, and Larry Foster, who was uh, in charge of public relations at the time, uh, quickly said uh, that we weren't going to talk until we had the facts. And so the PR department took something like 90 uh, messages from reporters and said, we don't know yet, but we'll call you back when we have uh, some information. Now, can you imagine what would happen to a company today if, if you told a reporter that we don't have a comment yet? I mean, reputations are destroyed in, in a matter of seconds yep. uh, to, today. It was a very, 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 uh, very, very different and difficult time, just to underscore your point. Yeah, yeah. Great point. Yeah, to, to that point, Bill, the, um, one of the strategies, as soon as it happened, was that we would keep Johnson & Johnson out of it because it was our McNeil uh, subsidiary that was uh, the maker of, uh, of Tylenol. So uh, we would all, you know, we would only talk about McNeil. We, wouldn't, we would keep from our public that it was Johnson & Johnson. So that strategy lasted about two seconds, I think. You know? uh, and we realized that uh, that was a turning point for the company. I mean, we never, we never uh, went public with much information at all. Uh, and uh, we learned a lot. We acquired uh, competency during that uh, uh, crisis that we um, just didn't, didn't have before. 
And uh, ever since then, it was uh, a lot easier and more comfortable for us to be um, speaking publicly about what was going on at the company. That didn't happen before. Interesting. The crisis changed our culture in that respect. We had, um, just, just to underscore the difference in the point, we had a situation um, on my watch uh, where uh, the New York Times uh, called at 4.30 in the afternoon and said, you have 30 minutes to comment on a possible wrongful dismissal of a manager in your plant in Puerto Rico. And it was um, tied to a possible side effect of, uh, of the drug. And um, I called, um, well, we got, had 30 people on the phone, including lawyers, who said, you've got to deny that. And um, we took the decision. We didn't have enough facts um, at our disposal to, uh, to comment. And so my decision was, uh, we're not going to respond uh, to the Times. The next morning, the story appeared, and we lost 17% of our value in the stock market. Uh, we, we, we actually brought down the market. Uh, uh, and um, somebody said to me, that's sort of a, a, a career make or break move. And um, we got everything together, though. We got our facts, and within a day and a half, we were able to issue um, a fact-based um, report, um, um, which, um, as we pulled it together, we realized that we what, what we said on Thursday, um, we would have had to retract on Friday. And uh, so we think it was the right call. And all that value came back within about 10 days. Um, um, but, but that's the speed with which, and the consequence which, with which uh, things can happen today. I saw a hand back here. Yeah. Um, earlier this year, um, Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock, which is the largest investment company in the world, if I've got that right, uh, he sent a letter to CEOs, and it was, it was a pretty long letter, so I'm not going to summarize it here, but he did mention, it was called the sense of purpose. And in that letter, he laid out the reasons why we kind of got where we are, or where the company got, where BlackRock got with needing to address CEOs on certain issues. And um, he said that a sense of purpose was really uh, critical to what any company was going to be doing, and that if companies didn't have a sense of purpose and did not engage their stakeholders effectively, they would lose the license to ex exist, basically. And he also talked about the importance of long-term strategy and the feeling as an investor that uh, they needed to see long-term strategy versus the short-term strategy that people have been focused on lately. So my question to you is, and I don't want to catch anybody off guard if you, have, if you haven't actually seen the letter, but my sense is um, people are talking about it. So my question would be, um, in, the com in, the, in the place that you go and the people you talk to, are people talking about this letter and then are people, <laughs> and then are people, what, what is your sense of what companies are trying to do to process this information and then operationalize it? So if I could, I could start, because I, we, we actually talked a lot about it at our management committee, and we, we, uh, we, we find it, in, within J&J, &J, uh, first of all, we find it a bit humorous, because we feel like, okay, he kind of he probably just looked at our credo and and lifted it from there, um, but in seriousness, I do think I do think what he did, what Larry did, was a was real service uh, in trying to get corporations to think differently. Um, I certainly think from a um, from an order perspective, there is this notion of a couple of things. One, that companies have to, and I'll say it again, they do have to have a social contract with society. And certainly at J&J, &J, you know, that's, that's very much part of our culture in terms of, you know, our purpose, which is, is embodied in our, in our credo, which really is just a series of responsibilities that we think we have, first and foremost to patients and consumers and mothers and doctors, uh, and then to our employees and to the community, and then lastly to, 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 um, to shareholders. Um, but importantly, it's not so much just having it there, but you actually have to live into it. And so very much like, um, like Bill said, it's about, uh, it's about the actions that you take. And, and like someone else, I forget who mentioned it before, part of the reason I think we've gotten here 
is because companies have been too short-term focused. Uh, you have a lot of companies today, and particularly companies who I would say are very, um, you know, very high profile, but I would say there, there are a lot of first-generation companies. Uh, they haven't had to go through those generational changes where all of a sudden their employees, their customers, really want to know, well, what else are you going to do besides just make money? I mean, what is this, what is this responsibility that you have as an institution, uh, a contract, so that I understand that you are taking care of me on a number of different ways? And it, more and more, citizens, other stakeholders are saying, if you can't do that, and I think this is where Larry was going, you don't have, you no longer have a license to operate. Um, because as great, as great as Johnson & Johnson is, or GE, um, we don't have a license to operate. There's no law that says we have to be in business. It's only because our stakeholders allow us to be there. And the only reason they're going to allow us to be there generation after generation is if we have our priorities in the right way. And that if we do it the way I think is, is spelled out in our credo and what Larry spells out, I think that's the long-term key to success. And companies that don't do that, I do think they are in peril of not being going to the second generation uh, as an entity. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I read the letter. I think most folks uh, in our business have. Uh, it was a very important letter. And it reflects, though, I think, a, a trend that's been going on um, for some time. You know, first, and I agree with all those points that Michael made, but the first is that employees themselves, as I kind of mentioned at the top of this, conversation, the importance of what's happening internally, employees are really demanding that. Interestingly enough, when we did some research, though, we, only, we found that only 19% of employees actually felt their companies were living their values, were living up to their stated values. So there's still a lot. It's not the case at Johnson & Johnson, I know, but a lot of companies still have a, a great deal to do to, to actually make sure that their own workforces um, believe that they believe it. The, 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 the other thing is that we've had this, this movement that from really what began more with, with philanthropy and strategic, and by the way, our, one of our fastest growing divisions in our company is social impact, which advises on this very issue. And when I look back at what the assignments were five years ago, let's say, it was around philanthropy, strategic philanthropy. We then moved to CSR, corporate social responsibility. All those things basically saying that a company has a responsibility to behave responsibly throughout its, throughout its whole supply chain and so on and so forth. What started to happen really, uh, and Michael Porter wrote a lot about this probably five or six years ago, was this notion of shared value. Right. And um, I think it also came, by the way, uh, I don't think this was the cause, but it happened to coincide with a retrenchment that uh, we saw a lot of governments um, working in areas where, in fact, they have a responsibility to deal with some kind of social, social issue. And folks like Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever and others, who's kind of been one of the Pied Pipers of this, really preached uh, shared value. And, and it created, a, I think, in most companies, a really good, healthy discussion around, okay, what, what does shared value mean? And for, for a company, it should mean it's not just doing good things, it's identifying social need and then what kind of unique skill sets do we have as a company that we can apply to that social need. And we can still do it in a way that makes money. It doesn't have to all be charitable. Um, and that, that's now all of a sudden a strategic conversation about their business. And when they look at research, like our research, uh, to the point of your point earlier about millennials, 51% of millennials say they will buy on the basis of whether or not a company is, is uh, living up to or is, is expressed and is living up to some kind of uh, social purpose. Um, so their, their own employees are pushing them in this direction. They're now seeing it from, um, from their customers. And um, uh, Larry Fink was great to point it out from a from the financial community, and I think it's a trend that's, you know, going to continue. Roger, um, Roger Bolton. One of the page principles, of course, is um, the, an organization's character is best expressed by its people. Before you were in your current role, you, of course, were CCO at Aetna. 
How how did you through through your how how did you how did you express Aetna's corporate character through your workforce? So um, I, I want to answer Linda's mm -hmm. question and yours together. To me, the 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 importance of what Larry Fink was saying and what a lot of people are talking about, I fully agree. It's it's mainstreamed in the conversation. It was. One of the main topics at Page, we're doing some work around corporate purpose. We're actually doing a global study on it. To me, the question is, why do we exist? What value do we create? And when I was at Aetna, to get to your question, Craig, the first six years or so, we hadn't really thought about that. But if you kind of think about the way we acted, the reason we existed was to help big employers manage to afford health insurance for their employees by trying to keep costs down. That was kind of what we did, so that you would assume is why we exist. Midway through my tenure there, the company had managed to alienate doctors and patients through its activities that way, along with the rest of our competitors in the sector, but we were kind of exhibit A in everything that's wrong with health insurance in America. And the board kind of, in addition to earning and enmity, we also were losing money. So that's also a really bad thing from a board perspective. So the board made a change in CEO and brought in a doctor to run the company. And Jack Rose is his name. And Jack came in and said, let's do some real thinking about what's our strategy, what's our business model, what are our values, what's our culture. But most importantly, why do we exist? And the answer to why we exist is to help people, people, not corporations who buy stuff for people, to help people get access to the health care they need and achieve financial security. And it changed the way Aetna employees thought about why they went to work every day. Aetna employees were, we were under siege and almost ashamed to admit they worked there. I mean, it was a, it was a living, so we showed up every day, but I mean, it was, and it changed. Oh, it took us six years. I mean, it's not like we flipped a light switch. But that idea led to six years of hard work that energized people and made them want to go to work and to be a part of something that they could believe in. And you know, millennials get a lot of credit, deservedly so, for being more sort of purpose-driven and oriented. But it's a basic human value that all generations want to be a part of something that's meaningful, that helps make the world better. And so, it's really an opportunity. It's not, gee, should we have sort of a social purpose or should we make money? It's we can and have to do both together. Did, did you have, you, you and Jack came from very different places. Um, I remember sitting in on a conversation that the two of you had at Page Future Leaders meeting a number of years ago that was really riveting. Yeah. Did one of you had to have to pull the other one along or was there, were you aligned? We were, well, we were, we were mostly aligned, um, although we, you're right, we came from very different places. He, he asked me to lead the culture change, and I looked around for, who are you talking to? I'm your PR guy. <laughs> um, but that was before I came to the realization, as I said earlier, that the central role of the CCO really is to help the company define itself. Um, I wanted to, and my partner Elise Wright, who was my colleague in HR, wanted to survey our employees, wanted to know what employees thought. And Jack was not up for that because he'd come from a union environment. And so we had, we'd worked through some things, but we were fundamentally aligned in wanting to change the nature of the company. And it was a real privilege for me to be a part of that change. Yeah. It was a great story. One stayed with me. Uh, let's go here and then I'll go here. Right. Mike, Mike, right there. Oh. Go there, though. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing us your insights and stories in the PR, from both from the PR agency side or the corporate side. I'm an NYU graduate student, and I, I will graduate soon. I'm writing my paper about uh, beauty PR, uh, and I think my question is more about global communication strategies. And I'm from China, and my paper is about um, some beauty PR. Some beauty brands, uh, they have uh, brand their, uh, they have built their brand images as being cruelty free, which means they are, they do not do animal testing during any parts of their uh, production or manufacturing process. But when they 
announced that they will enter the Chinese market uh, where the government always required animal testing, uh, a huge backlash on social media occurred. So I want to ask you what kind of strategic steps come into your mind when we uh, uh, to handle this kind of crisis for the beauty brands? Thank you. You're going to make me answer that. <laughs> <laughs> the um, well, it's it's a great illustration of how, and and it's particularly true. You're right in the area of social impact and and social purpose to um, understand how it goes across the globe. Because, and there are many examples like the one you gave, where there are different cultures. Um, in your case, you, you mentioned something that's actually a regulation in, in China, but oftentimes you find this play out uh, in terms of um, uh, in terms of the, just the culture being different um, and you know and by the way I think so often um, we're really and I, we have to kind of oftentimes make sure we don't fall into this ourselves as agencies um, you become very U US centric or Western centric in the kinds of both the research you do oftentimes um, and, and in the, the kind of strategies that you come up with. So the, we try to make sure that, that and, and by the way, and, one, you know, and we don't need to tell anyone in this audience, is that everything is global. So it's not like you can keep this message to, to just one audience. Um, there are times when we're willing to take some of those issues because we think the, the broader communications platform is powerful enough with enough people that it's worth it. Um, but it should always be assessed. You shouldn't be, if you're, if you're selling globally and you're communicating globally, you shouldn't be surprised uh, at the end of the day by different reactions. It means that you really haven't done your homework uh, to figure out how, how the message is going to play, in this case in China. Um, one of the many things that the people that worked with Bill learned from him was that the equity or the reputations held by the constituencies, not by the company. And uh, I've been thinking lately that we are, many of us feel that our government's not making enough progress in a lot of the things we care about. And we feel strongly about some of these brands and some of these companies. And I wonder if the companies are kind of getting thrown into the foray because we feel like you should do something for us, right? Boycotting sometimes feels like the only action a citizen has <laughs> that matters to anybody. So I wonder if maybe there's an extra lens on what you do that's coming from that lack of activity in another sector. Well, I, I, I'm going to take one crack at that. Uh, I think this may be what you're saying. Um, I am concerned. The one concern I have about the whole social purpose thing with companies is that people may believe that it relieves governments of responsibility for things. And Bill Gates, by the way, talks about this very eloquently. I mean, he's been going knocking on doors of heads of state, you know, for the last few years saying this, that you know, this notion of public-private partnership doesn't mean that the public side does less and the private side automatically does more. Uh, it means that there's a partnership where more resources and better resources are brought to a problem. And for us to begin to think, I mean, take Johnson & Johnson Health. You know, we spend, in the last uh, foreign ops bill, it was $9 billion for public health. That was the appropriation of the United States for public health. We couldn't have, have made the progress we made with HIV AIDS, you know, without PEPFAR. Now that what we had, you know, what we had was great cooperation and alliances with the pharmaceutical industry to develop antiretroviral drugs and all the things that led to the, to that, to, to us starting to get a handle on that disease. But if it weren't for the six billion of that that went to, anti, it went to PEPFAR and HIV AIDS we wouldn't have been able to solve the problem. So I, I'm just I'm pointing that out as one example of, it, I get worried, and I'm, I have other, other hats. I'm involved with a number of different sort of global health and development organizations, and I get very concerned that this is going to be used 
uh, as a way to let governments off the hook. Um, so it's a good it's 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 a good question. I'm not sure that was the answer you were. I'm not sure that I was addressing exactly what you were talking about, but you prompted that response. <laughs> I, I think that that's a part of it. The shift from public to private is one you know concrete way that gets worked out. But I think there's also just you know a frustration among citizens that we can't get any kind of progress in so many things we care about, and we're trying to throw someone at the problem. And if we think that you know you've been effective and you've got this reputation, and we have affection and respect and and trust for the companies, then please do something. I mean, I feel like that sometimes, yeah. and I know a lot better. Well, I no, and now and I, I I agree with you. We the same poll I mentioned earlier on the millennials. I think it was 51 percent of millennials expected CEOs to say something about important public policy issues. Um, and I think that comes from this, this frustration that they're not hearing leadership from, from their public officials. I think that's, and I, I think in some respects that's a good, it's a good thing because we're, we're getting people involved. I think it can be a dangerous thing if, uh, if corporate leaders feel somehow pushed into, get, pushed into areas that they either don't have competence in or is not related to the to the um, mission of their, their company, frankly. Go ahead, Erica. And I'll just add that the notion that I mentioned earlier about authenticity, I think that's what's important, is that the, the public or publics are demanding that CEOs and organizations comment on these big social movements and issues. However, the comment could be, this, is, this doesn't fit within our realm, or this doesn't fit within my area of expertise, and we support the, you know, the different, the, um, that there are different opinions on this issue, and we, we hope that um, there is a re resolution in the near future, you know, and we'll continue to, whatever it is that you do, bring it back home to what you are really about and what your expertise is. Um, and I think that that goes a long way versus just jumping on everything and commenting on everything and having an opinion because obviously that can get you in a lot of hot water. Um, but I think that that's kind of a careful balance between that demand from the public that say something, do something, I need to hear something from you. Um, and the more I hear from you and if I happen to agree with it or support it, the more likely I am to support your organization and yeah. be yeah. a long-term uh, consumer. So I think that that's, that's somewhat how organizations can um, handle that, that sticky balance. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll call out one person, Ken Frazier at Merck, you know, um, when he uh, commented, when he, after the Charlottesville incident, and he resigned from the President's Advisory Council, um, that was, and I know Ken, that was very authentic. I mean, he, and it came across that way. It had nothing to do with his business. Well, it does because it's right. important to all, all of us. But a lot of people but, followed him, and and a, and a lot of, and he showed leadership, and people mm -hmm. people followed him. But I, I think, you know, that was a great example of where it came from the heart. It was very authentic. He knew what he was, uh, he knew what he was doing, and the consequences of it, and he spoke his mind. Steve Pedestrian, I know that you've been waiting patiently. So, thanks for the discussion, guys. Um, thinking about the students uh, in the room and thinking about uh, even some of the practitioners early in their career, I want to go back to a couple things mentioned, Erica, by Erica, by you, and by Michael, by you, about how difficult it is to figure out how to communicate in this environment, right? Michael, you mentioned just the paralysis that companies feel in this environment. And, you know, with everything said about trust and truth and character, totally agree. But we're in an era where segments of audiences are defining truth by what fits into their ideology. Yep. Probably like never before. So I'd really um, appreciate, and perhaps the students would and the practitioners would, what advice you would offer them about how to communicate to audiences that are so divided on issues, that are so divisive, and damn the facts or the statistics, their truths are defined by their, the way they see the world. It's an incredibly difficult 
uh, environment to navigate. So from the great discussion and the years of experience to the you know, ground level of being a practitioner these days, I uh, would appreciate your perspective and advice to the students and the practitioners in the room on how to carry about. I'm, I'm not um, as competent as I used to be to tell you how to communicate because all of this is, is brand new too, but where I start is what are we going to communicate? And um, as we were talking about the importance of, of a values-based foundation, um, the question is, um, how does that really play in terms of decision-making? And that's part of our, our title over here. And um, in my experience at, um, at Johnson & Johnson's for the 90s, um, we um, put in place um, a, a kind of a little mantra that we uh, use very simply in times of crisis. The first question is, what happened, which is, you know, what do we know and what is it that we don't know? And then, you know, uh, conventional um, practice would take you to what are you going to do about it? But we, we, we put another step in there. We said, uh, what happened? And at, with all this information, then we asked the question, so what do we believe about what we know about what happened? And that brought the values into play in terms of, of forming the, uh, uh, the decision. And, um, you know, so based on what we know and what we believe now, how does that structure our decision as to what we're going to do? Um, so, so, I mean, that's my starting point. And, and we always worked hard. Roger, um, I'm not taking all the credit for this because Roger played a huge part in this, in assuring that um, our decisions truly reflected, you know, the, the, the behavior that was consistent with our credo values, and and it, it was, you know, that was the first that was the first order. Um, in terms of, of getting the message out, you know, I there there are many many techniques, and as I said, I'm not competent on that. But uh, one technique that we used that I still think could work today. Uh, when we were faced with a significant challenge and the media, we chose to craft our communication, our explanation to our employees in the form of a letter um, to explain to employees first. And then we'd call reporters back and say, we're not going to issue a, a press statement, but if you'd like to see how Mr. Larson or whoever is explaining this to employees. And that added just a, a little measure of credibility to it because the reporter had to say it wasn't Mr. Larson who spoke, but in a letter that he sent to his employees, here's what he, you know, he had to say. Uh, 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 yes, it was uh, in the aftermath of a 17 percent decline in value of our stock. <laughs> Uh, in, in the 90s, um, I, I don't remember. I, yeah, right. Something that was right. What's called corporate communications, and the people are supposed to be message deliverers, storytellers, and it goes across it. So I think what you did then was actually sort of predicting the future. Well, we always took very seriously what employees thought about, you know, any, any kind of corporate speak. Um, it was really right out of our credo culture, yeah. you know, of, of, of attending uh, to um, the responsibilities to our employees. But I, I agree with you. I think during the 1990s, the importance of internal communications grew enormously and tended to become more of a priority in, in, our, in our field. I think you're absolutely right. And I, I would say even today, so in terms of just how do you do that, there is, and I think we believe, of all the stakeholders that you have, your employees are the most important stakeholder. And the reason for that is because it, and it, start, it starts with this premise that we have here today, which is 
Um, the public, other stakeholders don't trust corporations, but they still will listen to individuals who work for those companies. And so as long as you are thinking about them first and arming them with the messaging, that they know, they know the organization better than anybody else, and they'll know if it's authentic or not, and they'll be able to tell it in their own way, and they'll be able to use all the channels that they use, right? They'll be able to use Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, um, but if you are focused there around in, engaging your own employees, that's a, that's a great inoculation, I think, in the world in which we're trying to navigate. I'd like to just add, I agree with that. And I'd like to add that as difficult as this environment seems, Steve, and you know, there's so many voices and all that sort of stuff, in some ways, it's not easier isn't the right word, but we have the same tools too. And in past environments, if you got a bad story in the New York Times, it was very hard to fight that. And now we've got lots of tools at our disposal, our employees, but other stakeholders as well, Michael, with whom we build shared belief and build relationships over time with authentic interaction and facts and the ability to publish and reach audiences at scale in an authentic way that people who are good at it can really have major impact. And just I, I just want to oh, speak to the student perspective of his question. Um, I will say that academia has transitioned and continues to transition as the workplace does, as the industry does. Um, at, at Howard, the department I'm in is entitled Strategic Legal and Management Communication because all of those things have to work together in today's strategic, legal, and management communication is one department. <laughs> and, the, um, and that is something that has evolved within the last five years. And that is because that's where the industry is going and that every, everyone has to speak with each other in order to communicate on one united front. The program that I um, attended as an undergraduate has gone from mass media to PR to strategic communication within the past 20 years. And so we've seen this all throughout academia and that's how um, the workplace affects how we even teach the future leaders. But also as these students become graduates and become employees, um, it is important, as you all mentioned, to communicate throughout the organization what do we believe. And, and this whole notion of what is truth, what is reality. Employees, especially the newer employees who are not only learning the organization, but learning the profession and how to be practitioners for the first time outside of internships. And if they have a solid understanding of what the organization believes and how um, they, can, they can learn how to communicate those beliefs, especially because your younger employees are going to be um, many of the people running your social accounts, running your, your, newer, your newer communication channels. So it's of utmost importance that they understand and are able to communicate that belief because how many organizations have we seen who have gotten in trouble because of one tweet, have gone into a crisis because of one tweet, because of one inexperienced or ill-informed worker and now it becomes a major organizational issue. So how to avoid some of that is to really communicate throughout um, from top all the way to the brand new employees, even to interns, what do we believe? I really like that way, the way that you put that. Okay, let's, let's do this. Um, let's take one, maybe two more questions. We'll start here. Um, but I'm gonna ask the panel, panelists to multitask here because um, I love the exclamation point for those of you who have a parting shot to leave with our participants, both those here in the room and on the um, live stream, to think about if there's one kind of key message, key takeaway that you want to impart. So think about that as you're taking one or two more questions. Let's start here. I think I might provoke that. Okay. Um, my, my wife often says that she can take me anywhere twice the second time to apologize. <laughs> um, I want to bring the conversation back to the beginning here, the premise, and particularly one sentence. The very foundation of trust has been and remains challenge. First part question is, don't you think perhaps that communication professionals should accept some responsibility for that situation. And the second part is another quote. 
control the message. But if you try to control the messenger, you risk your message being discredited. So my second part question is, how do you advise your clients against trying to control the messenger? I'm, la I'm laughing, by the way, because when I was a political consultant, our first piece of advice, this was in the 80s and early 90s, my first piece of advice to them was to control the dialogue. He who controls the terms of the debate wins. That was our rule number one in political consulting. <laughs> And when I think back on that, nobody controls, you know, <laughs> nobody controls anything. So if you think that you can control the messenger um, and you can control the dialogue, uh, it, it, it's folly. Uh, so that's my answer to your second question. The first question is, yes, I do think that um, we take, um, I have to take a good deal of, of responsibility. But I think the trust, you know, uh, the trust, the root of the trust is in behavior. You don't, you don't build trust with words. I think somebody said that at the beginning of this. Um, you build it through behavior. And um, listen, you know, folks have some good reason not to trust institutions, a lot of institutions this day, because they've behaved terribly. Um, so, you know, we do have to kind of get back to basics. You know, the, 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 the thought that communications can, some, it's the old putting, you know, lipstick on a pig. The thought that the communications can some, somehow solve these problems, um, it can't. Now, poor communication certainly can exacerbate it, and that's probably where we take responsibility. But at the end of the day, uh, institutions and individuals have to behave properly to be respected and, and, and trusted. For, yeah. Well, and actually, we're, that, that's a good segue. So for the sake of time, I'll use that question as the launch in to closing thoughts. Anything that any of you want to say, uh, there'll um, be some time during the, during the reception to find our panelists. But are there any, any closing thoughts that you guys have? And then I've got another comment or two. So um, I'm an optimist. As, as difficult as the current environment is and as messy it is, as it is, and there are certainly a number of factors going on, uh, that Jack's sort of analysis was really spot on and, and helpful. But um, I see very strongly motivated enterprises of all sorts around the world wanting to get better and wanting to make the world better. And I think that trust has to be earned through authentic behavior. The value of values is it gives you a compass to guide your behavior. And it's really, really difficult to get an entire enterprise aligned behind a purpose and a set of values, but that's the job. And if we do that job well and focus ourselves on it, there is just tremendous opportunity to continue to improve the lives of people around the world. Thank you, Roger. Anyone else? Well, as we think, uh, I think about this whole uh, conversation, I think there are really two major themes. One is, um, I'll call it managing, the, uh, con the, the external conversation and, you know, the traditional function of, uh, of public relations, if you will. Uh, but the other theme, which is a different subject really, is um, uh, it's a difference between health care, you know, taking somebody who's sick and trying to make them healthy, and health, which is prevention and keeping people healthy. So you don't need a doctor. Um, I think Bill brought that to us. This, uh, it, it now maybe seems obvious now, but Bill had this idea that we could teach people how to behave in the organization and practice prevention and avoidance, and that that was a real prime function of the public relations function. Uh, um, that's, I think that's an important idea, that it's part of the responsibility of public relations to, to do that. It's not that obvious because of the word public, maybe. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I, well. That's great. Um, uh, so, I, what that leads to really is the answer to this question that this gentleman asked about an hour ago, which is what's under the surface? You know, and that's, that's what's under the surface. Um, understanding what it is about the tone and the mechanics going on, you know, the dynamics, 
below the surface among individuals and bo their bosses in an organization. What is it about that that leads to these mistakes that you need um, public management uh, uh, of in the, in the first place? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Roger. Go ahead. Uh, Michael alluded to this, as did the young woman who asked the question about the cos cosmetics. I think that those of us who are fortunate enough to live in New York or the New York area tend to forget that New York is not America, that there is such a multiplicity of views and passions out there that we tend to ignore. And I think we have to make sure that we take into consideration um, what people outside of New York um, think about things. Um, well, putting aside my past comments on bad behavior, I, I'm an optimist. I'm an, I really am an optimist, too. Um, I've always felt that communications was, a, was the currency of change and that communications, I mean, not to sound like I'm getting on a soapbox, but the communications is a real force for democracy as well. Um, the more communications you can get into a society, the more likely you're going to empower institutions to act on behalf of their citizenry. So I, you know, I think this technology is allowing much greater transparency, obviously. It's allowing for, we'll see whether Zuckerberg gets through his testimony today, but it's allowing for, for more people to be connected um, than ever before. And I think, you know, we're, we're just at the very beginnings of, we're in our infancy in learning how to, how to use it. Uh, and I'm optimistic because I think your students <laughs> and those of you who are here will figure this out. And if it's transparent and it connects people, it can be a good thing and should be a good thing. Great. Anyone else? Anything? So I'd like to close um, where I started, and it's echoing some of what you're saying. And that is to crank you all up on this, the importance of this function. I really believe in the midst of all of the changes going on, the lack of trust, that we are at the center of this moment with the skills, with the values, with the experience uh, to find a way forward. But I don't think we're gonna be asked. I think we have to step forward and take a lot of initiative. Um, any student of communications can look at a lot of problems in society today and understand the gaps in public knowledge that lead to misconceptions about, uh, you know, behavior uh, functions and responsibilities. We need to close those gaps and, and we need to employ all these skills that, that we have. Don't wait to be asked. Take the initiative. And I truly believe we have an opportunity to make a huge difference, not only in our companies, but in society. You're here. Michael or Arca, anything you want to close? You're here. You're here. Uh, I, you know, I, further than what, a little bit of what Bill said, uh, we're living in a, it's a great time, actually. It's a, there's a lot of disruption, and I think that's great. You know, so part of the role of communicators is, to kind, of, is kind of to revel in that and understand it so long as you understand the foundational values that you and your organizations have, right. then, then get after it and take advantage of the disruption and figure out how to use it. Um, they are wonderful things. You know, I, I can't imagine being in a, in a, in a time where it's it, no, more opportunity than we've ever had. So don't lose perspective is what I'm saying, but always remember how important it is to, it is to be grounded in the values, and I think that will lead you ultimately to doing the right thing for you and your organizations. Well said. Right. Last word, everyone. In closing, I made a few notes so I wouldn't ramble too long. Um, I just want everyone, wherever you are in the spectrum of the profession or your own profession, to remember to explore and discover truths within your own organization and within the profession. I think. The, the premise here is talking about external society, what's going on in the world outside of our organizations. Let's not forget what's going on inside of our organizations. If you are an experienced practitioner, make sure that you continue, I know you all do it, um, continue to mentor and sponsor individuals. If you're a younger practitioner, reach out, learn, 
what has been done before and where you can come in and figure out what's new and what can be done in the future. And if we develop these diverse and inclusive and collaborative um, knowledge and perspectives, I think that all of our organizations and all of us as individual practitioners will be better for it. And I just want um, organizations to remember, um, I've said it before with the authenticity, but also continue to communicate under a spirit of transparency and consistency is what's really key in terms of where we are as a society and in terms of where we are in terms of rebuilding and regaining more trust. I suspect we could have stayed here for easily another 90 minutes. So uh, how about a round of applause for our panelists? And, and if you'll stay there, if you'll indulge me, just a couple uh, quick last points. And how about another round of applause for our sponsors as well? Yeah. And, and thank you, too, to those uh, associated with the Museum of Public Relations, Shelley and Barry. And, uh, and their staff at Spectre and Associates. Um, indulge me two very quick last points. This, this is a, um, a brochure that has been in my portfolio uh, in whatever version of a briefcase or a backpack I've carried for the last 15 years. It's a lecture that Bill Nielsen did uh, at Ball State University in 2003. Uh, my NYU students who are here may remember me taking this out in class because I use it every semester. So in the spirit of the more things change, the more they stay the same. Let me just read a couple, just a couple of very quick points, all of which I think the seven panelists have made. Uh, uh, Craig, Craig, I don't have anything to do with your bonus anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think you did back in the day either. Right? But, um, this is from Bill in 2003. Learning, especially learning about public relations, is a never-ending search for experience, context, meaning, and perspective. Uh, just give me... Two more points, uh, another point from Bill. The political context, 2003, the political context into which we have been drawn recently as a result of some really egregious behavior by a few individuals and their organizations, think companies like Enron, all right, this is again 2003, could significantly dampen the potential for free enterprise as we have known. I think that goes to the point about, um, right, we serve our customers and our stakeholders. We serve because of our stakeholders. And last point is this. Uh, if an organization's core values are held up by management to be vitally important and those values are shared across the company, then it really becomes the responsibility of every employee, of every employee and all members of management to engage in decision making that is consistent with those values. And I think every one of our panelists made that point tonight. So I thank, thank you all. Last point, and then there's some wine, beer, and some refreshment. Tonight, today also happens to be Bill's 39th birthday. So if you would join me in a chorus of happy birthday. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bill. Happy birthday to you. around for a few more minutes, have a cocktail, have a drink, Don't meet the open. panelists. Yeah, Thanks better. again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.